to retract or not to retract? That is the question. So in this video particularly, we're gonna focus on the pressing aspect as the example on scapular retraction. Hopefully you can take the principles that we talk about in terms of how the scapular muscles and its position should function in a variety of movements outside of this as we continue to tell the story uh, in future videos of how we should and should be managing the scapula in different movements where we are moving the humerus. So with really quickly, very basic scapular anatomy. Okay, a couple of things just to preface. Everybody's scapular anatomy is gonna be slightly different from the shape of this fossa in here that the actual humerus sets in to the shape of these little hooks and horns that are coming across that are gonna be the things that actually run into the scapula causing that joint to jam uh, in certain positions or limiting range of motion. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we look at this, uh, we have our rhomboid. So if this was my actual scapula, it would be the guy on this side. So if the, you could see through me like transparently, you would have my rhomboid fibers that were kind of running along this edge. And then when you would have my serratus fibers that are kind of on this side here, okay? And so the serratus fibers are gonna be the ones that would pull my scapula around the body forward and retraction is gonna be done by the rhomboids pulling it back and up. Now re retraction is not straight in, it is up. So it's like a, it's an angle like this through my back. So if these were my scapula and I'm like, if I'm going through, retraction here, right? So it's, it's literally, it's, can't do this right. I'm trying to do two directions at once, right? So it's this motion, okay? This is largely done by the, the traps. The more upward it goes, the more upper trap dominant, the more downward it goes, the more lower trap dominant. And then there's going to be pec minor and levator and stuff in there that'll help coordinating the rotation. But the, um, but the, uh, the serratus and the rhomboid are gonna be the things affecting our retraction and protraction. So they're gonna be the ones that we focus on the most when we're talking about a press, because obviously we're talking about should we move the scapula in this plane as we are acting on a load in some sort of press. So what we need to do is look at just like how things are set up in a press. So what I've done for this model here is we are going to look at a bird's eye view. Um, it must be a meathead because his head is way too small for his body. Um, but so we have a bird's eye view looking down. Here's his head, here's his torso, here's his humerus. And then the red here is the scapula, right? That is nicely cradling the humerus as you see right here, which is kind of what we want in a press. So if you think about it, we have essentially the fossa here, which is kind of like a T. And then I have the end of my humerus here that's got like this nice soft round spot that can kind of glide around and rotate in there. So it's like a golf ball and a T analogy that we will use several times throughout here. Let me tighten up his rotator cuff. So when this thing is functioning properly, that T is always going to be supporting the golf ball. So if we look in the context of a regular press, okay, if you think of it, we should have our rhomboids would be the things that are doing our retraction force this way, okay? And our serratus is going to be the stuff that is going to be pulling the scap around this way. Both of those together create kind of almost this hugging effect of taking this guy and making sure that he stays tight to that rib cage. Okay, so they have an important function of not only moving the scapula anteriorly and posteriorly like this, but actually like sucking the scap to the rib cage, right? So that everything can function appropriately. Like if your scapula started separating from the rib cage, like we see with like scapular winging and stuff like that, like that's obviously not a good and stable position to be in. So those two need to function in sync to maintain that kind of like suction against the rib cage, okay? In terms of the mechanics of the actual press, the uh, serratus fibers that are going to pull, like pull everything around this way are gonna be synergistic to the function of the pecs and my rhomboids are going to be more synergistic to the lats and a lot of the upper back musculature, right? So everything that pulls anterior or post here. Now, if we look in a press, what should happen in a healthy press is as the arm comes around, the scapula comes with it. And the reasons for that are if you think of the, if we look at this right this way, like so if this scapula was nice and retracted and I had a load pushing this way, 
there's, there's nothing. Like all you see is my little bungee cord here, which you could think of as representation of all of my rotator cuff muscles. So this, not a happy shoulder joint, right? Now, if the scap is able to articulate around to support that, it's a lot harder for me to actually like separate that joint. So the amount of work that the rotator cuff has to do and all the other muscles that are essentially helping traction, like keep the golf ball on the tee, so to speak, that amount of work is dependent on the scapula actually being positioned along with the humerus to overcome any sort of resistant forces that would be pushing into it. So in this case, if a dumbbell or a barbell or whatever is pushing down, I want to have that tee situated at least somewhat underneath that golf ball so that I have good stability there. And that's going to do two things. One, it's going to take a lot of the pressure off of the muscles that have to stabilize the joint. And it doesn't mean they're not going to have to stabilize. They are. It just means they don't have to stabilize in excess. They can, they, and they're not big muscles, right? If you think about like the size of these muscles, like your rotator cuff muscles are really small. So their, their ability to handle excessive, you know, loads is probably not that great. Um, and they don't usually get to say, stop. Usually it's your prime movers that we're focusing on mentally when trying to contract harder, et cetera, et cetera. So they're going to get less, or they're going to be under less stress. If I actually am able to position that scapula around with the humerus throughout that press, because this is the top uh, of the press, so to speak. Okay. The other thing, all right, is if you think of it like my pec fibers in this position, right? If we think of like, this is my insertion point and I got an origin over here. Obviously we have different divisions of the pec that would be pulling either more down or more up like costal clavicular, all of that stuff, uh, which we will dig deeper into later. Maybe this video, who knows on the tangents I get into, but so roughly at this point, this is the direction those fibers are pulling in, like it's that vector. Okay, so it's more across the body. Now, if there was not stability from that scapula and that serratus there, what would happen is these pecs would be required to help stabilize this from doing that, right? So I would need my pecs, I'm gonna need that later. I would need my pecs to make up for the fact that I don't have this stability by pulling the arm up this way to resist it from basically separating my shoulder. So my pecs can actually act more on the load, which is what I would want. And my stabilizers don't have to work as hard if this comes around. Now, when I want to also say, I didn't preface this at the beginning of the video, when we get in the context of power lifting, there are some considerations beyond joint health and training the pecs. Cause what we can say is a power lifting press is not a press for maximal shoulder health. It's not a press for pecs. It's really a tricep press that's done in a specific condition where you have to unload a tremendous amount of, of weight and perform it for one repetition. So there's some special case scenarios where we can talk about the pros and cons of this specific to that, but this would be, everything outside of needing to do a one RM power lifting thing, right? So my pecs can work more on the load in this particular situation where everything has come around. So now let's, let's talk about what happens with retraction as I pick up my marker here. So if I incorporate retraction, all right. And so what we'll do is we'll leave, this as the nice good side. And since I actually have the bones for the right arm, we will make the right arm the bad side. Okay. So you can already see where I'm going with this. I'm going to shorten my arrow a little bit. Okay. So on the right side here, if we asked this to retract, what well, essentially what we would have is instead of this like T coming around and supporting the golf ball, what I would end up getting, if we put this guy in here like this, right? I don't know why his right arm so much bigger if it's the bad side, right? But I'd be trying to pull this, this way while trying to pull this, this way. All right. And Hopefully you guys can see that this is like a shoulder separating force. And when you add the fact that that rib cage in here is going to essentially function as like a fulcrum to make it like easier to stress that out. Okay. All that retraction based force. So the harder I retract and the harder I try and use my pec, the more strain I put on the shoulder joint. Okay. So that in itself is already bad. Okay. And the act of trying to retract from a neurological perspective, 
is going to compete with the serratus function. So from a programming perspective, like in terms of motor patterns, what I'm doing in those movements is I'm training my body to underuse the serratus when I'm overcoming a load that is pushing this way. Okay, so I'm training my body to stabilize my shoulder less when I press if I am actively trying to retract. So if you can imagine if we're training our body to stabilize less and less and less, that means we are taking ourselves closer and closer to injury. Uh, we are likely limiting uh, any performance gains that we're going to achieve, possibly regressing uh, in those, right? I mean, it really depends on how hard you try and do this, how often you try and do it, the volume at which you try and do it, any preconceived conditions. There are some people that can get away with this for quite a while and other people that after will get injured very, uh, very quickly. Some people when they do this, or I should say the majority of the people when they do this, it, it creates enough stress on their system that we can see an immediate decrease in range of motion and function around that joint if you actually know where to look, what to measure. So um, what we will end up having is this competition of the scapular trying to be retracted by the rhomboids because you're consciously trying to do that and the body trying to figure out a way to stabilize the shoulder and act on this load, okay? So one thing's for sure, if you're retracted, you will not shorten the pecs more. Right, like if you're here, if I'm here, I like if this is pulled back, there's no way that this can continue to go around unless you actually do separate your shoulder. And I have a feeling that's gonna be a setback in your training, okay? The other thing to consider with this is when we look at this pec here, being able to just like focus on that, well, if the serratus can't do its job and I don't have the support of the scapula, that means the pecs now have to be responsible for supporting my humerus against the load that's pushing this way. So that means my pecs not only have to do this to the arm, but they also have to resist this simultaneously. So that means the amount of load I can act on is significantly less, okay? And it also means that as I'm going through this movement, there is a lot more potential for me to all of a sudden step outside of like my optimal position and create a tremendous increase in stress on the joint. So let's walk through. So concentrically as I'm going through this, I'm limited on the amount of force that I can produce because I'm fighting myself and I'm taking away the stability and I'm forcing the pack to do multiple jobs. But what's gonna happen is most people, their body is going to fight them back and you're gonna get a little bit of serratus function, right? So wherever you determine your end range is, so like if you're here and you're letting it do this, obviously the scapula is coming. You haven't fully separated your shoulder yet. So you are, the, the serratus is just it's trying so hard. It's like little, you know, Tommy the train or whatever it's called. It's just like, he's trying, 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 trying to carry that scapula around and give you some sort of stability despite the fact that your rhomboid is just trying to bully the crap out of him um, with your intent. So we got this guy pulling hard, this guy succeeding just enough with the help of the pack to get it around, right? Extremely inefficient way to press, okay? It probably, you may have a lot of feelings because your nervous system is micromanaging all those positions. So there's a heightened sensation that we get. So if that pack is having to do two jobs, is it gonna feel like it's working harder? Yes. Is it gonna be working optimally? No. Is it going to produce more hypertrophy or better strength gains? No. Is it going to be better for your shoulder? No. Okay. What is likely going to happen is that you are going to train your pec to function less to help fight the rhomboid less, right? And regardless of whether you are able to get better at this lift, okay, it's likely not going to be from improvements and contractile strength of the pec. What it's gonna be is, you're gonna get better at using anterior delt, you're gonna be better at using coracobrachialis, you're gonna get better at incorporating biceps and triceps, right? So you're gonna become a better compensator in this movement, which is gonna even add more stress to elbows and shoulders over time in terms of wear and tear. Okay, now, let's talk about the big whammy because we got a case study here where I'm gonna try and illustrate the injury that occurs. Uh, when you have stuff, stuff like this. So most of the time when we tear a muscle, we tear it on the eccentric, not on the concentric. It's very rare that we tear something on a concentric. And even if we do, so like in a deadlift, it's a concentric and then people tear a bicep, but the bicep wasn't doing a concentric. It was being like pulled like in a lengthened stretch. So let's talk about what happens on the way down. So we got this guy 
And let's see if I can get him to function properly here. I always get his elbow joint flipped around. There we go. All right, so we got our guy here, right? He's gonna go through this pr pressing fly motion thing here, okay? So we've managed to get him here with limited stability, like the serratus barely got to do enough job to get him here, right? And now he's gonna be going down. And now, now we're doing this movement, which actually, which actually works with retraction, but you're overemphasizing that retraction. What's gonna happen is you got this little bit of stability and you're just gonna pull the rug out from underneath it, okay? And what that's gonna do is it's gonna go from I got something, I got something, to I don't have anything. And that instant change in stability from the scapula is going to throw a tremendous amount more load on the pec and the rotator cuff, like instantaneously, like the equivalent of you standing on top of somebody with a pile of plates and they're going through their thing and you just drop an extra six plates just right on top of their bar instantly. Okay, most people's pecs are gonna tear. And so there's a chance that you're doing this, you're doing it slow, you're doing it controlled, and who knows, maybe you survive 10 reps, maybe you survive 1,000 reps, maybe you survive the rest of your life. Maybe you're one of those lucky people. But a lot of people going through that are going to at least tweak something. They may not rip stuff off the bone, right? But they might tweak something. And some people are going to tear stuff right off the bone, right? Or tear like, like tear the midsection uh, of muscle tissue, right? So, because w w as you're going through that, that act of trying to excessively retract an antagonist of the serratus is you're gonna get to a point where that retraction is going to win. And at that point, if your body is not prepared to all of a sudden significantly increase the amount of pec tension, then you're gonna tear something. So the closer you are to the max load that you can use, the less, op the, like, the less you will be able to buffer that change in stability, the greater degree of fatigue you're at. So because, I mean, this is huge because a lot of people will injure themselves at like warm-up based loads, sub-maximal loads with this but your risk of injury is higher at heavier loads, right? And closer to failure or in, in any degree of pre-exhaustion, pre okay? So that's just, that's just one way that this happens. We're not even, we're only talking about the scapula and this wrapping them around plane. So we haven't even incorporated the change in mechanics that this over retracting is going to have on the scapular rotation that needs to occur, the amount of tipping that needs to occur, or any more of the complex neurological things that are going on when we're trying to actively like overcome force with two competing inputs, right? So I wanna leave this with just a little bit more scapular stuff. So because there's, so glenerohumeral humeral rhythm, right? Refers to this rhythm of like, all right, how much does this move in relationship to this? And that exists in all planes of motion. So a lot of times it's just spoken of, of like in this lateral raise type movement. So it's like, okay, some people will be like, this can move within 30 degrees before this has to move, okay? That's not true. What is true? is that at any given point in time, under any specific conditions, there is going to be an optimal relationship between the scapula and the humerus that provides the optimal stability for that joint, the optimal mechanics for all of the things around that joint to function. So at this position, right, depending on the force that's being put into this arm, how much load it's in, the relationship of where that arm is and every single plane is going to affect how your body articulates this with your traps, with your rhomboids, with your serratus, with your levators, with your pec minors, everything that acts on this scapula and the rotator cuff. Even your biceps and triceps come into play in terms of sucking this joint tight and managing. Like you have so many muscles that cross the shoulder joint and it's not a coincidence that it needs to have a stability and control under a tremendous amount of positions and forces. So, thinking that we can consciously decide where this should be better than our brain can on its own is a huge mistake that you're gonna make, right? So in reality, if we focus on doing the proper things with the humerus, unconsciously, this should do its job. So when we're talking about cueing people, uh, I don't like to cue them to retract, protract, elevate, depress, like any of this stuff. I like to fix what's going on with their setup, how they're acting on the load, what they're trying to do uh, with their prime movers, 
And what will happen is the nervous system will quickly figure out how to assist that with those scapular positions, right? Are there very few exceptions to that? Possibly, and usually those are in the cases where there was an injury or something where there's a certain amount of reprogramming that needs to do just to get the body to a point where now it can have adaptive function. So this, the scapular humeral rhythm, glenoid, uh, glenoid humeral rhythm, whatever you want to call it, okay, semantics is what really what it comes down to. The concept is, is that this always needs to be at the perfect spot in relationship to this, and that's something that we're not going to consciously be able to control. And so if we're doing a press, we need to allow it to come forward. If we are doing a row, we need to allow it to come, come back. And that should happen on its own through the cueing of how we're acting on the load, not cueing of doing this. So the solution to this is not to actively protract, right? Like, okay, if you're, so if you shouldn't retract, you should protract. No, that's not going to be appropriate either, right? Because that's going to create other issues with stability. This needs to be in the perfect balance of protraction and retraction at any given moment. And that's something that we just shouldn't consciously be trying to manage. We should let our unconscious nervous system that is far more effective at multitasking than we are consciously, we should let it manage that. So uh, what I do want to do is leave this with a little bit of a positive note. So if you are a person that has been actively retracting during your pressing uh, and you've been pinning that stuff back, likely you have poor function. Um, and sometimes that can be, well, quote unquote, fixed fast. Sometimes it's slow. Okay. Like I said, the solution is not to try and do the opposite. The salute and the solution is not to try and consciously manage the scapula. The solution would be to start training exercises where you are consciously trying to wrap around the body without necessarily using a lot of load. Cause likely you're going to have to, you're going to have to change the programming that your body's going to be trying to excessively retract or antagonize this wrapping around motions in a variety of planes. So in reality, there's probably a lot of work to be done there um, to get you to perfect function. But what we want to do is at least remove as much dysfunction as possible by stopping you from consciously trying to hold retraction while you're pressing anteriorly. Now, being retracted in a fully stretched position or retracting to be able to get more of a stretch is valid under certain conditions. So retraction does lengthen the clavicular and some of the sternal fibers as it pulls me here, right? But it does not lengthen the costal fibers. So depending on the movement that I do, retraction may be a component of getting into a stretch there, provided the exercise mechanics allow for it, right? So we'll have to dig deeper into what about, you know, doing this on a bench, you know, should you put a foam roller back there? I'll tell you right now, my my stance is going to be most of the time no one will show how the foam roller actually just creates a different type of uh, you know scapular jamming than the bench does uh, but you want to make sure that you you use the or you stay within the limitations of the exercise so there will be exercises where you can't get full retraction there will be exercises where full protraction or wrapping around just doesn't suit the mechanics of the exercise like if it's a barbell or a dumbbell like you're not going to do a dumbbell press and then come over here, right? You would need to have a fly or something that gives you resistance and allows you to carry through those motions. So don't just shut off your brain and be like, oh, Coach Cass says don't retract, so now I'm gonna protract and I'm gonna do all these things in the front, right? Stay with us. Uh, this may take two weeks. Uh, we go into much more detail than this in our courses, uh, but I'm trying to at least give enough information that a lot of because a lot of a lot of people are really struggling right now with they don't know why they don't function or they're maybe not even aware until we see them and like what are you doing can't even do a row or whatever they have to micromanage every single uh position and it's like just like simple things like do a row and they just like nothing seems to function intuitively right so we're trying to provide as much help on this platform as we possibly can. So if you guys have questions on social, put them through, I will answer them uh, quickly. And uh, I'm gonna try and do one of these, continuing this story along uh, every day, probably until I leave for Texas, if I can get it done before that, uh, cool. Um, and we will eventually get into some exercises that 
you hopefully with all of this logistically you will be like yeah absolutely that's garbage um, and then hopefully when I point those out it doesn't make me look like the bad guy for just being honest and truthful on hey this is just this is bad information that's being put out because um, ultimately our goal is to save as many of your shoulders and make <laughs> and your careers uh, as possible and put everybody in the position to be as successful both as a trainee or a coach or, or a trainer.